Good evening, students. It's uh, six o'clock here, and I'm sure you're all in the sa same time zone, uh, being all in India. So I wish you all a very, very good evening, wherever you are, Patna, Mumbai, wherever you are. Right? Session is a very fruitful session for you. I hope you also like to appear for the test, and uh, I don't know really how you feel about the test. You can give me some comments if you like. Uh, I have here with me. Uh, on the laptop uh, Aditya right and he will keep telling me about what are, are your comments what are your uh, uh, I would say observations or any suggestions or the doubts so anything that you feel you you are very very much invited to share with me here and I would love to hear from you whatever you you, you need to say let this let us make this an interactive session so that you are happy and I'm also happy I'm, I'm really happy when we are doing an interactive session so let's start and uh, uh, before however I start with this question I, I hope that you recall what we did uh, on the last uh, 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 class that is yesterday and if you recall I told you that in the beginning if you you tackle the paper if you start with the paper uh, as a psychologist would which means you have to understand the mind of the exam setup right so you have to actually understand what could have made this person set this question what must he be thinking you know there are different kinds of thought processes possible here uh, you can think okay this person is probably thinking thinking that i have not read the ncrt but i will prove this person wrong i have read the ncrt very well and i know that these statements are exactly from ncert yeah the next uh, thing that you could think of is well uh, what is the meaning of twisting it here or uh, this this looks the same as in given in the ncrt but looks like one uh, one word is somewhere changed right so what could be the reason for changing that one word it could be just to confuse me which means uh, the the meaning is the same as given in ncrt or that one word change can actually mean that there is a whole new change meaning to that statement so you have to understand the psychology of the exam setter and that is something i am repeating and again and again so repeating and again and again so that makes it double double and triple so that's the importance of knowing the type of question i also discussed with you yesterday there are different types of questions you know one there's a type of question that i i uh, call a simple factual type question right okay let me write this down here for you so you could have a simple factual question and more or less straight from the ncert so these are usually no problem uh, to solve and you know these are these are the easiest types right another type of question could be what i call the mouse trap question i did discuss this with you yesterday there was one question there and i what i'm seeing is that it has made its, its way into this paper also i don't know how that happened but uh, this mouse trap question is a is a way of reminding to you that mouse trap questions are probably the trickiest because they look simple right they look very very simple but are they have a trick but have a trap or a trick right so you might be forced to think or you might be tempted to think that this is a very simple one but actually when you go ahead to solve it somewhere you know you might you might even think okay uh, this is so simple i'm marking it correctly and later on you come to know no the answer was not this the answer was that so then you realize oh i didn't look at that particular word or that, that particular connotation oh i got i, I got tricked so this is those, those kind of questions right then there are these jargon type questions now what are these jargon type you know in english jargon means a, a statement that or a word which is very very technical you know so sometimes the concept is really simple straight from the ncrt but it is hidden behind some technical words which make you think that it is very difficult so sometimes you know it's a very simple very very simple really you know very simple question but hidden behind technical words right so this is something that i would like you to understand that even though the technical words might sound as if something that you have not probably studied till now but it might just be a very simple thing just stay cool 
and think twice about it maybe there's something which is really simple here okay and do have that faith nothing nothing really can come out you know so much out of the syllabus i have to know this it's only that something is not coming to my mind so don't panic just think calmly you'll get the answer right i will give an example for this now there was a question that appears sometimes in neat i don't recall the year but it was like the question was asking about the organisms which are i would say barometric or i would say barophilic organisms you know i don't recall the exact uh, exact question but somehow the question asked you to know barophilic organisms now if you really think about it you probably have not heard about the word barophilic right so this is a technical word it's a jargon type question now you might be actually tempted to think no i i don't know this word so i don't know this question i've never read about it but let me just make you understand this that this word is actually very very simple barrow you mean you know means pressure right and philic means loving so those organisms which love to live and live to love not love to live live to uh, love to live under a lot of pressure that's a tongue twister so a lot of pressure would mean somewhere in the deep reaches of the ocean where the pressures are very very high and the options are very simple and one of the options was of course living under in the deep seas or deep oceans so this really seemed like as if it was very very technical very very difficult i haven't heard of this word but before dismissing that question as i don't know this do think about it twice and thrice and just think to yourself i must know this there there can't be a word that i haven't heard it's not that difficult so let me just think it over and sometimes just logicking it out can you know work things for you so that is the next time then there is a kind of uh, questions uh, i would say the right and the wrong take the correct and the incorrect uh, uh questions so these are really tricky they're not difficult but they're very tricky you know suppose the question says that you have to mark out the correct option right and you have been given 1 2 3 and 4 choices now often what happens is as you start reading the options somewhere in the middle you tend to forget what was i trying to do whether i was trying to take the correct option or the incorrect one you know so that actually may make you tick on the incorrect option and particularly when you're in a, in a hurry you don't have that much time in your neat exam so what i would suggest is in this case that you actually mark a symbol against that very option now is this statement correct or not no it is not correct is this statement correct or not this is not correct okay this is the correct statement this is again not correct so what kind of option do i have to take the correct one so okay the third one is the correct answer so the the trick here is to mark a cross or a right against every statement that you're reading that will help you to you know assimilate things at the end and you know make you tick on the correct answer right so this is the type and there's one more although of course not many um, examinations uh, do include these type of questions but these are and very can be very tricky and these are the assertion and reason type of questions now the best thing that you can do here is between the assertion and the reason put a because and see if it really makes sense right it has to really make sense the reason has to be an actual reason for the assertion so just read out the assertion first and then put a because then read out the reason it really does it make sense to you if it really does then you have you can say that the option is one that means the both the statements are correct and the reason is the correct reason for the assertion given so these are some of the tricks i'm telling you although we cannot go too much uh, uh, into this because we are uh, we are running on a deadline so i think we will start with the questions right away now if there is anything that comes to your mind uh, again i'm sa- saying this to you if if it's something to do with academics something to do with a question something to do with your psychology something to do with time management just about anything that comes to your mind that you need to discuss you 
you can put up the question i will try to answer it to the best of my capability so i will now take up the first question which says in genetic engineering the antibiotics are used as selectable markers to select transformants as sequence from where replication starts or to keep the cultures free of infection now this is a question actually a repeat from the last uh, uh, question paper that we we handled and you know uh, I called it as a mouse trap question because you can see that the first and the second options are really confusing. I yesterday explained to you what is the difference between the first and the second option. Now, do you recall? Come on, tell me. Do you recall what is the difference between the two? Okay, if any of you recalls this, it's very good. But even if you don't, let me just quickly repeat this to you. When we are talking about the marker genes, the genetic markers or selectable marker genes. Now when we talk about the selectable markers, these are actually the genes or the DNA, right? Which helps us to select out the transformants from the non-transformants, the recombinants from the non-recombinants, right? And when we talk of the antibiotic, right? Now, we cannot call an antibiotic as a marker because this is simply that chemical which is helping us to select out, but it is not the marker gene. And as I told you yesterday, uh, the selectable markers are those genes which help us to select, right? And they broadly fall into two categories. One is the antibiotic resistance gene and the other one is the visual marker genes, which means the genes which produce some kind of visual effect, right? Now, these, these antibiotic resistance genes are the selectable marker genes, right? And they do not code for the antibiotic, mind you. They code for antibiotic resistance, right? But with the help of the antibiotic, you can select which particular bacterium has resistance to that particular antibiotic, which means that will actually tell you which selectable marker gene does that organism have, right? Now, that is, I think, clear. So I can quickly move on to the next question that says, Genetic engineering has been successfully used for producing. Now, uh, this is again a question straight from the NCRT. So, if uh, we go by the classification of the questions, the second question according to me uh, is a simple factual type. Although a lot of words sometimes add to your confusion, please don't let them confuse you. Just sit calmly and analyze them you know, very, very, very peacefully and you will realize where the, the answer lies. Now, if you see the first one, transgenic cow, rosy. Of course, trans, transgenic cow is rosy and we have read about this example in the NCRT. But rosy does not produce high fat milk for making ghee. Rosy is responsible for producing uh, milk which is rich in human lactalbumin, right? So that's wrong. Animals like bulls for farm work as they have superpower. Well, no, you very well know this is not the option here. Transgenic mice for testing the safety of polio vaccine before use in humans, straight from the NCRT. Yes, mice are being produced, uh, you know, in that way. In fact, they have some human genes so that we can test for the safety of the vaccines before administering them to the humans. So, they're definitely. Um, I, I think uh, you do know that earlier it was the monkeys which were used for this safety testing but the animal rights activists were very much against it right the monkeys used to be kept in uh, your uh, big cages and really mistreated and they used to be given shots and and they would see whether the monkey would die or develop the disease or not so it, it actually does sound uh, it is actually very very cruel right so because of the uh, animal rights activists you know the uh, the trend is now changing and and the scientists are producing the rats or my mice to be more precise mice with human genes so that we can test the safety of vaccines on them instead of testing on the monkeys well that actually does make me ask a question is uh, is cruelty to mice not really animal cruelty even that is a form of animal cruelty but i guess higher the level of consciousness of the animal the more pitiable the condition becomes okay no let's not uh, argue and let's not discuss much about the ethical aspect here. The, the fourth option says transgenic models for studying new treatments for certain cardiac diseases. 
Well, if you see the option in the NCRT, in the statements in the NCRT, you'll find that it's clearly written that we're using the uh, transgenic uh, animals, particularly mice, for studying normal human physiology. That's number one. Number two, uh, for studying development of the human diseases, right? And number three, molecular events, right? So as a specific point, it's nowhere given there whether it's being used for studying new treatments. However, let me tell you that this is also being done now. So this might actually turn out to be a correct option if given in isolation of the of another correct option, which means if I were to choose a statement or a choice here which is absolutely correct, I would go by the NCERT standards, right? Because in NCERT, the fourth point is not given as such, so we could club it with the rest of the incorrect choices. But if you really ask me, if you Google actually, you'll find out that even the, the treatment of certain diseases and cardiac diseases are also being studied as an option, right? So this could actually come in both the categories. But here, of course, since the third one is exactly from the NCRT, we will we will take that as the correct option. Now, let's see the next one. And that is the third one. The first, yeah, are there any doubts? Why, what is hybrid? Hybridoma. Hybridoma. So is that Ashutosh asking? Yes, yes Ashutosh, I, I do remember that you asked about the hybridoma and probably you were waiting for today to put this question again. Um, what do you say children? Should we quell the doubt first even though it's not related to the question paper today but still it's there in the, um, uh, the chapter. So, so uh, okay, I'll just take a minute to first explain what is a hybridoma. Now hybridoma as the name will make it clear has to be a combination of two things. It has to be a hybrid of two things. Now, what are the, these two things, you know? So two things that we're talking about is the beta cells or beta lymphocytes. Now, what is the function of the beta lymphocytes, children? I'm sure you know about that. They are the ones which produce the antibodies in your immune response, right? Now, beta cells are, or lymphocytes, when they are made to fuse with myeloma cells, myeloma cells now what are these myeloma cells there are kind of cancer cells right so cancerous cells when the both of them are fused the cell which is formed is termed as a hybridoma right now this hybridoma cell has characteristics of both of the cells which were made to fuse here the lymphocytes, what is the characteristic of the lymphocyte? It can produce the antibodies, right? And what is the characteristic of the myeloma cells? They can undergo divisions. In fact, cancer cells are known to undergo uncontrolled divisions, right? Now, suppose we want an antibiotic of the same type. Now, if we take a certain type of beta lymphocyte that makes a certain type of antibody, if the number of those beta cells is very less, we will get a very less harvest of those antibodies. But suppose we want those antibodies in abundance because we, we want a lot of them, right? So we need the beta lymphocytes of exactly the same type in large numbers, right? So However, you know that beta lymphocytes are differentiated permanent cells of the human body and they do not undergo divisions on their own, which means that they need to, uh, they actually need some impetus like fusion with the uh, myeloma cells to do that. So the property of the myeloma cells also comes into the hybridoma and these cells can actually undergo divisions as well as making the antibodies so all the cells that are produced by the division of this anti this this hybridoma cell will produce the exactly the same type of the antibody right and in fact you must have studied about this These are called the particular epitopes of the antibodies right so these kind of antibodies are called monoclonal antibodies and are very effective in uh, not not only in the treatments of diseases, not in the treatment, rather prevention of the diseases, but also in so many other procedures that requires the antibodies, uh, like for example, the ELISA test that you have studied about. So, so many different procedures make use of this highly efficient, efficacious uh, monoclonal antibodies, right? So, Ashutosh, is your, is your doubt clear now? Now, can I move ahead? You have permission to do that? Okay. 
Okay, the third question is the first step in production of insulin using E. coli is now this is again from the NCRT. But uh, let me discuss this question to you. And before I start with it, let me ask you this: What kind of question do you think is this? Is it a simple factual type or a mouse trap type? Okay, just just classify the question right here in front of me, and then I will start. Aditya Bhaiya, can we close the door, please? I think we'll be better off and. Uh, the voice will not resound. So, isolation of messenger RNA transcribing for insulin from pancreas cell. That is the first option. So, I will take it up option by option, right? Now, children, this procedure is very much given in the NCERT, right? So, if you recall the NCERT, you can uh, probably just stick on the right option without thinking much about it. So, this is a particular uh, question that I could actually label as a simple factual type simple yes simple factual type absolutely you're absolutely correct i i guess some of you who is who is telling me the answer simple factual Sanjana type uh, parveen and anshika all of you are absolutely correct this is actually a simple factual type because it's directly from the ncert However, I would like to deal with all the options with you here because sometimes we have a lot to learn from the incorrect options also. So the first one says isolation of messenger RNA transcribing for insulin from pancreas cell. Now children, I really wanted to understand this. Okay, now let me begin with the zygote. We know that we all start our lives from a single cell which is called the zygote, right? And the zygote has all the different genes that can ever be present in, you know, the humans or us, right? Now from this cell, by divisions and further divisions, you will find that we get all the different types of cells which get specialized to perform different functions. We get the RBCs, we get the pancreas cells, and in the pancreas also you know that there are different types of cells like beta cells and all those right then we have the wbc's and the nerve cells and all the different types of cells which are specialized to perform different types of functions right now even though these cells express a specific set of genes right they do not express all the genes present in them but they actually have all the genes present in the zygote because Ultimately, they have been formed by the divisions of the zygote only, right? So all these cells have all the genes, but do not express all the genes, right? So what are, where is the difference, children? They have all genes, they have all genes, but they do not express all the genes, right? Now, if you want to take out a gene, a particular gene from, say, any random cell of my body, it could be the intestinal uh, cell, it could be the uh, skin cell. Obviously, it has to be a living cell for me to be able to take that uh, gene out. So, I can actually take that gene out from any cell of my body, provided that it is living and it has a nucleus, right? Which means if I want the gene for insulin, I can extract it from any cell of my body provided it is living and it has a nucleus, right? Even from the WBCs because the WBCs also have the, all the same genes which the zygote had and, and which all the other cells of my body have. The only difference is the WBCs do not express the gene of insulin, right? Now you understand the difference, right? So when I'm talking about isolating the gene, if I want to isolate the gene itself, I can do that from any cell. Obviously not from the RBCs, RBCs because RBCs do not have a nucleus. So that could be a trap here, right? So uh, not, not the RBCs, any cell which is living and which has a functional proper nucleus, you can you know actually uh, isolate the gene, right? So I can say that I can isolate any gene from any cell of the body provided it's living and has a nucleus that is the catch right now uh, this was actually what was done for the human insulin gene right uh, the next this this particular option first one says isolation of messenger RNA now if we cannot isolate the gene I told you yesterday also if we cannot isolate the gene, if there are some problems with the isolation of the gene, then what we can do is we can extract the messenger RNA for that product and 
make the gene by reverse transcription right so what can we do we can take for example if it is messenger rna and we we have the messenger rna isolated from the cells right and uh, we we can actually make it undergo reverse transcription and form a type of dna which is called last session who will tell me the answer come on quickly i'm waiting for your answer which dna is formed by reverse transcription of messenger rna let's be quick i'll move ahead only then any answers aditya mm -hmm. there's a lag in 6 seconds 6 seconds all right never mind so just, just put your DNA. yes complementary or copy dna so c dna absolutely right now mrna can be made to form the c dna and this is the c dna which can function as a gene for us right so this is also a possibility right a third possibility is we can synthesize an artificial gene also now you have uh, synthesizing a uh, an artificial gene if we know the base sequence so we have now available to us gene machines so these are the three most important ways in which we can obtain the desired gene isolating them so isolation can be done from any gene from from any cell of the body because all the cells have the same genes now the second thing is that we can isolate the messenger rna and then form the c dna which which we can use as a gene that is done by reverse transcription but now my question arises is if i have to isolate the messenger rna i will have to isolate it from which cell can all the cells give me that particular messenger rna well it will depend actually if that product is formed only in a specific tissue then you can actually take that isolate that messenger rna only from that particular cell for example just telling you theoretically although it's not done for insulin suppose i had problems in you know isolating it for the insulin then uh, i would have to go to the pancreas cells and extract the messenger rna from there because the insulin gene is not expressed in any other cell except for the beta cells of the islets of langerhans so for extracting the messenger rna i have to take the cell which expresses that gene not just the cell which has the gene right okay so that is the difference that is how i decide you know which cell would i take for the isolation procedure so therefore uh, the second second option if you see isolation of nucleotides transcribing for insulin from pancreas cell now nucleotide is not enough not because nucleotide is actually a monomer it's not a gene so that will not serve any purpose now isolation of gene producing insulin from human dna that is the right answer as i told you attachment of the gene producing insulin from human dna to plasmid using ligase well this does happen but this is not the first thing we do first we isolate the gene and then we link it with the plasmid using ligase to make a recombinant dna so uh, the statement for per se is not incorrect but this is not the first thing that we are doing here right so that is why the third is the answer now before moving on there is one more question uh, i will put up from you because uh, there is a slight lag so your doubts would be probably a little late in uh, coming but i will predict what kind of doubts you might be having and one question that i am uh, asking you is why can't we isolate the messenger rna trans transcribing insulin from the pancreas cell and then subject it to reverse transcription and see and form the cdna uh, i am telling you we cannot do that uh, for our purpose if we want to make insulin through the uh, recombinant dna technology like you have studied in the ncrt we will have to isolate the gene only right isolate the gene only but not the messenger rna tell me quickly i'm waiting for 5 seconds for you to tell me why can we not um, you know take the messenger rna for insulin and make the cdna so you have to give me the answer first and then i will tell you what whether you were right or wrong and what is the actual answer meantime i'm moving ahead or do you need some time for the response okay i'm giving you some res response time i'll quickly rub this out by then uh, what is the difference between si rna and mi rna all right si rna mi rna i will definitely tell you the difference these are the two types of uh, rnas used in the interference rna they are actually found in the interference rna type uh, but i will take it up at a later point because here we are discussing a topic uh, which would get mixed up with it so i am writing your doubt here 
right? Small interference RNAs and micro RNAs, right? It requires cellular environment for procedure. So the answer has come. Who's given the answer? Rushil. Rushil has given a, uh, the answer that it requires a cellular environment for the procedure. Which procedure? Which procedure does it require the cellular, uh, uh, you know, Freezer environment? Well, uh, you are trying to think and I'm happy you are trying to think, but I will tell you the reason for this. You know that the human insulin has two chains, the A chain and the B chain, which are held together by disulfide bonds when it is proper functional insulin. But you know that the human cells actually secrete it in the form of pro-insulin, which means to this, these two chains is attached another peptide which is called the C peptide and this is non-functional, right? So if we take out the messenger RNA and then subject it to reverse transcription to form the cDNA, we will not only get the A chain and the B chain but also the C peptide, right? And the bacteria do not have a means to cut this C peptide out to form the functional human insulin. Please try to understand. What happens in our body is that this entire thing is formed, right? It is first transcribed as messenger RNA. Then messenger RNA is translated to form this whole thing. And after translation, there is a mechanism in the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans by which this is actually cleaved to give the functional insulin. But the bacteria into which we are going to insert our genes does not have that means to cut this up. So what we do is we isolate the gene, uh, the, the sequence for the A chain separately and B chain separately, insert them in different cells in the form of recombinant DNAs, obtain the two chains differently, separately and then join them together with the help of the disulfide bonds. Now this is something which is given in the NCERT. So again my advice to you is not, don't just read the statements, do please try to understand the various implications of it, you know. Sometimes the, the question might be slightly twisted. So what I asked you was actually out of NCRT only, but it was very concept based. So if you understood the concept, you would be able to answer, otherwise not, right. So however, I hope this one is clear to you. If you still have a doubt, I will come back to it, right. Shivanshu now, not clear. Yes? Shivanshu was not clear. No, not clear. All right, Shivanshu, uh, let's go, go about this again. You know about the human insulin, right? Functional human insulin, which is also called the humulin, right? Now this humulin or the functional insulin for the humans has two chains, the A chains with 21 amino acid and the B chain with the 30 amino acids, right? These two chains are linked up in the form of disulfide linkages with the help of disulfide linkages and this is what is the functional insulin but let me draw this for you suppose this is the DNA right and this is the gene for insulin right insulin gene or DNA so what happens in the beta cells of our body is that these particular this particular sequence is actually first transcribed to form a messenger RNA this is a process that you know called transcription, right? Then this messenger RNA is translated. So this is called translation. And now we have with us a structure which looks something like this, which means we have the A chain, we have the B chain, and we also have the C peptide. Now, this is what is termed as the pro-insulin. This is not the functional insulin when it is first formed, right? Now, for this to become functional, there are special enzymes in the cell which cut it from here and here. So, when the C peptide is removed, then we get the functional insulin. These are the disulfide links, right? So, when we have to make Escherichia coli or the other or any other bacterium for that matter to make that insulin for us, what do we do? If we put this whole sequence and if we get this structure in the bacterium, the bacterium does not have the enzymes to cut it from here and here, right? So, what I am trying to say is that if I am using the messenger RNA, 
right it has these sequences for the c peptide also but i don't want the c peptide because the bacterium does not have a mechanism to cut it out so what i do is i take out the you know sequence for the a gene separate a, a chain separately and the b chain separately put them into different types of e coli cells when these two cells make a chain from here b chain from here then i put them together to form the functional recombinant insulin that i am using today in the treatment of diabetes mellitus i hope that's clear i hope really i really hope that's clear now okay so because i don't want a simple answer would be i don't want this c peptide because i don't have a method to remove it well not me the e coli does not have a method to remove it right so i don't want this but if i use the messenger rna i will get this also right so i don't want this right that is the reason why i cannot use the messenger rna in this particular case right but if there was no uh, non functional part to it then i could have used it right clear, clear? no clear perfectly not clear perfectly i think uh, you will need to work on your concepts there or uh, okay we will come back to it once again once we finish with the paper because um, we have to at least stick to some timelines but uh, what i will suggest is that you read this again from the ncert and from any other good reference book where a diagram is given or what you can do is watch a youtube video right that's the best thing you can do so you watch a youtube video of how this insulin is being prepared by genetic engineering today right so when you see this happening on the video you will definitely understand this right all right so a uh, question number 4 uh, no that question number 5 in transgenics expression of transgene in target tissue is determined by okay so we will take this question up well i think i have forgot to congratulate the toppers today so the toppers for today are nayan sanchita kajal pralay shrijanya manika ankit shruti and aruth right aruth and taruni right so all these people are doing a great job on their studies and i really wish you not just these people i wish you all all a very good luck for the upcoming exams just keep working hard and be sure of yourself be confident be uh, of course you have to work hard to achieve that confidence right uh, okay so let's take up the next question now what is a transgenic organism children tell me what is a transgenic organism when we talk of a transgenic organism we actually mean an organism which has received a gene which is not its own gene which means for that particular organism it's a foreign gene right so when the foreign gene is it enters into their bodies and it is able to express maintain and pass that gene on we will say that organism has become genetically modified so if i were to put this very figuratively let me take this here this is this is a, a host right unicellular or a multicellular organism a host cell right now suppose the native dna right native dna means its own dna so this is the own dna of this host right now if there is a dna belonging to some other organism which means this dna is a foreign dna to it right now if we somehow by some means by either you know injecting it forcefully or by combining it with a vector if we happen to somehow introduce this new gene a foreign gene foreign gene into this cell or which you are calling the host and when this gets integrated either integrated or even if it is separate in the form of a plasmid it happens to be expressed it can express itself now do you recall what is the meaning of expression well i told you yesterday expression actually means a smile or a sad face or when it comes to humans and you know uh, the living organisms or the animals but expression in terms of genetics means transcription and translation to form proteins right which means if this new gene that has been introduced somehow is expressed to form the protein right and it is maintained so the first thing is expressed maintained which is which means it is not thrown out of the cell right and the third thing is that it is passed on stably to next generation right 
So there are three parameters for, for uh, defining a genetically modified organism. That is what is a GMO or a transgenic, right? Yes, children, I hope you are with me. Once again, if we put a foreign gene into a particular host, if that gene can integrate with the DNA or if not, if not integrate, then even if it is lined separately, but it is able to express itself, it is able to be maintained there in the cell, not thrown out. And number three, passed on stably to the next generation. Then we say that this host has become genetically modified. It has become a genetically modified organism or a transgenic, right? Which means it has a new set of genes, a gene which did not belong to it originally, but it is now being expressed in it as a part of its genome, right? But this host will be termed as a heterologous host because this particular gene does not belong to it originally right now when we talk about the expression of a particular gene inside a heterologous host what are the various factors on which this expression depends now again this is a very very interlinked type of question right this is a type of question where you will need to interlink information from other chapters as well and which chapter here you have to recall you have to recall the second chapter of genetics here right recall that you studied how exactly the uh, expression takes place how does the transcription take place how does the translation take place and particularly moving on to the process of transcription you have to recall I'll draw this quick diagram for you. Now suppose this is the cistron, right? This is the cistron to be transcribed to form messenger RNA. You must recall that there is a small sequence on the upstream part here, which is termed as the promoter, right? And at the end, there is a sequence which is termed as the terminator, right? Now, this is the path where the RNA polymerase enzyme recognizes and binds, right? So if this the circle represents the RNA polymerase, the RNA polymerase recognizes certain sequences on the promoter, binds to it and then moves ahead to transcribe the messenger RNA. So messenger RNA cannot be formed or transcription cannot occur or in other words expression cannot occur unless there is a promoter with that gene that we want to be expressed you understand so if i'm sending a gene into another host but if i forget to put the right promoter with it what will happen it will go inside probably get integrated maybe maybe not but it will not be expressed because there is no promoter Right? So the presence of a promoter is absolutely essential for the expression of any gene. Now think of it this way. Suppose insulin gene, I'm inserting the human insulin gene into the E. coli cell. Right? This is what we do when we are making the human insulin from the E. coli. So human insulin gene, if I am inserting into E. coli cell, Will that E. coli cell express the gene or not? So the, the, what is the catch here? The catch is that human insulin gene is a eukaryotic gene, right? And eukaryotic and even if you happen to have a promoter, it, has, it will be a eukaryotic promoter. And the eukaryotic promoters are different from the prokaryotic promoters, which means the RNA polymerase of E. coli will not recognize the eukaryotic promoter or the human gene promoter, right? So if my insulin gene has my promoter and I put it inside the E. coli, the E. coli will refuse to recognize it because the promoter has to be a prokaryotic promoter, right? So if I want a eukaryotic gene to be expressed in the host, which is a prokaryote, then I have to attach it with a prokaryotic promoter or somehow see to it that a prokaryotic promoter is there. So in other words, if this gene is a eukaryote and if this is a prokaryote, 
देन दिस जीन विल नीड टू कैरी अ प्रो कैरियोटिक प्रोमोटर राइट तो दैट इज द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ द प्रोमोटर इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ जीन यू नो एक्सप्रेशन सो आई होप यू अंडरस्टूड दिस दैट प्रोमोटर इज अ वेरी इसेंशियल कंपोनेंट and we when we actually deliver a gene we do not just deliver the gene we can't just take the gene uh, this is strong for the insulin and put it inside the host and say now you express it no it will refuse because there is no uh, there's no promoter to go with it right so we have to add the right promoter and make a gene construct right and a proper gene construct is the one which is going to be expressed so the answer here is promoter let's quickly go through the the other options trans gene trans gene is the gene which is being transferred the foreign gene that we were talking about reporter reporter genes and reporter enzymes also play a role in genetic engineering a uh, reporter gene is a gene which produces some kind of a visual effect that helps us to recognize the transformants from the non transformants or recombinants from the non recombinants now if you recall we had studied that the marker genes can be of two types generally the antibiotic resistance genes and the second one were the visual marker genes so these are the visual marker genes which are also called the reporter genes right for example the same lag z that we were talking about the one that produces that blue color in the colonies that's also a reporter gene right and uh, we have that we have a gene called the luke gene l u c luke gene now this is is this is the luciferase gene this is the gene which is uh, responsible for causing the bioluminescence in organisms like jellyfishes and fireflies so we can use this gene also as a visual marker so such genes and their products are called the with the reporter genes and the reporter enzymes respectively but this does not have anything to do with this kind of expression what is an enhancer an enhancer is a gene which is found in the eukaryote operon model well so to speak eukaryotes do not have proper operons uh, i would say the kind of operons found in the uh, prokaryotes that you have studied like the lac operon they have a much more sophisticated system of gene uh, regulation and that is called a gene battery you know so the eukaryotes have not operons but gene batteries for regulation right and in this gene battery there is a gene called enhancer gene and as the name will make it clear the enhancer gene makes a product which activates a certain gene to express right so that's an enhancer gene right so these are the different options and i'm sure now this is clear to you or i will move on to the next question jaise bhi to bolne ki har jagah answer reporter diya hai aap bhi bata rahe ho promoter मैं फिर से देख लेती हूँ आई विल लुक एट इट वंस अगेन इन ट्रांसजीनिक्स एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ ट्रांसजीन इन टारगेट टिश्यू इज डेटरमेंट बाय नहीं दिस इज एब्सोल्युटली एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट द आंसर इज प्रोमोटर बिकॉज द एक्सप्रेशन नीड्स अ प्रोमोटर रिपोर्टर इज ओनली फॉर सिलेक्शन ऑफ ट्रांसफॉर्मेंस आई एम सेइंग दिस वेरी वेरी कॉन्फिडेंटली आई डोंट नो व्हाई द अदर बुक्स आर टेलिंग द आंसर रिपोर्टर द आंसर इज डेफिनेटली अ प्रोमोटर राइट एंड आई टोल्ड यू द लॉजिक आल्सो for expression expression means transcription and transcription cannot take place unless there is the proper promoter to go with it right okay so sixth or sixth question is vaccine for hepatitis b is the first generation second generation or the third generation vaccine and the of uh, the correct is the second generation vaccine so that now we have to i think uh, um, need a little more um, elaboration on this we would need to know what the first second third generation vaccines are so let me rub the board and give you this entire idea so i'm rubbing out the names of the toppers also but once again congratulations so s i m i i have to remember that also all right so right talking about the first gen second gen and the third gen vaccines what are the different types of vaccines here now you already know about the first generation vaccines you have studied about them in your chapter on immunology you know about the live but attenuated germs which are used or sometimes inactivated ones 
right completely inactivated or dead ones which are used right as an inoculum uh, the kind of immunity that actually Jenner Jenner developed this is this was first uh, you know developed by Edward Jenner for smallpox so this is the first type of vaccines developed so what we do in this is that we take the germs or the pathogens which are used there which could be live pathogens or they could be dead attenuated or dead right so we we actually you know um, insert them into the blood serum of now that will again depend if we first insert them into the uh, animals and then take the antibodies from them in, and insert them into our bodies it is what is called the passive immunity right but if we directly insert the germs into our body and we ourselves make the antibodies and this is called the active immunity so the kind of immunity that you've studied the passive and the active immunity this is actually the first generation vaccine because here we are using the complete pathogen uh, okay i will explain it to you figuratively now this suppose this circle represents a cell of the pathogen right so this is the pathogen this could be a bacterium this could be uh, virus also but here of course the virus will not have a cell it could be any other eukaryotic organism also so a pathogen has you know some DNA inside it and the DNA has the gene right so we'll need to understand it like this now this is suppose the genetic material or the genes for making some kind of proteins now the DNA makes some types of you know proteins or other macromolecules which are present on the surface of these uh, pathogens and you know that these are termed as the antigens and it is against the antigens only that the antibodies in our body are formed right so what we are doing in the first generation vaccine is that we are using whole germs whole pathogens right inserting the whole pathogens to incite the or induce the formation of the antibodies now what is the second generation vaccine in second generation vaccine these are actually the recombinant proteins right mostly these are the recombinant proteins and which protein are we talking about the antigens only the antigens so in this case by recombinant DNA technology we obtain only the antigen protein right so which means by recombinant DNA technology, we just obtain this protein, the antigen protein, not the whole germ, right? Only this and inject it. And we know, you know, obviously, you know, when, when it's only the antigen which is required to induce the formation of antibody, why take the risk of it, you know, putting the entire germ inside? And you must have heard of cases where the uh, germs were not properly attenuated or not properly dead and they actually turned out to cause the disease rather than to prevent it you know there have been cases of polio vaccine actually giving polio to the patients at times because the germs are not properly attenuated right so this obviously this uh, this kind of uh, vaccination has its uh, drawbacks so to overcome that it's better if we can just get these antigenic proteins right and then inject them in the body and get the immunity against them so we can do that by using the recombinant dna technology in fact uh, uh, in ncrt also, also it is mentioned uh, these days the hepatitis uh, in fact one of the first second generation vaccines to come up was hepatitis b and uh, also now we have another one for influenza which is a second generation vaccine so here we are talking about the recombinant proteins which we require which we get by genetic engineering or recombinant recombinant dna technology we also use subunit vac subunit uh, you know uh, proteins also here which means we can actually use a, a particular part of the antigen also not the entire one right so these are the second generation what are the third generation vaccines the dna vaccines are the third generation vaccines they are completely synthetic and they do not make use of living organisms as such so what are exactly these dna vaccines so what we do in this is we isolate the antigen gene so what we are doing is we are isolating the antigen gene from the pathogen and inserting it injecting it inside the body injecting in our body so what happens is we are actually making some of our cells pick up that gene which means get transformed right so this dna or the gene antigen gene that we are talking about you know 
some of the cells of our body get transformed and starts making the antigens against which the antibodies can be formed right so here which means we are not even taking the proteins from here what we are doing is we are straight away taking the antigen gene and putting it inside our body so that so that our cells only make the antigen and then again our blood only makes the antibodies against them so that is the third generation vaccines that is the dna vaccines so here as you can understand that actually to be very very precise now we have third generation vaccines for hepatitis b also coming up but uh, obviously that's the latest news we will stick to the ncrt and we will mark this as a second generation vaccine seventh question on what indian bio resource did environmentalist vandana shiva's effort uh, get the patent cancelled uh, well this uh, as the the answer tells you this is actually about the neem you must know that uh, there was a patent filed for neem in the united states to tell you uh, an interesting piece of information the patents can be awarded as of now as as per my information only by two countries one is united states of america and the other is japan now that's unfair you know i i really do think it's unfair why do only us and the japan has the right to award the bio patents but then it is so and um, there was uh, a company which had filed a patent on neem saying that they want a patent on the medicinal uses now that's really really very unfair because in our ancient texts and i for example the ayurveda we know the medicinal effects of neem from thousands of years and how can somebody from united states say that this information is something new and they have a right to it so that's absolutely unfair now uh, vandana shiva is actually a very big environment activist in, in fact she was uh, uh, you know in 2003 i think she was named the environmentalist of the year at that time the environment hero at that time in the time magazine you know by the time magazine it's a very very prestigious magazine so vanna shiva is a very very important environment uh, environmentalist from india so it was her efforts that actually stalled this patent so this is a you know piece of information that you would probably relish now the eighth question tells uh, a different story and what is the eighth question let's see yes flower sour is a variety of tomato tobacco mustard or cotton so here as you can see that the answer is one and that is tomato uh i wonder if you know about this flower sour variety um this is a kind of variety of tomato which has a high shelf life Now, what do you mean by high shelf life? You know, fruits like tomatoes they get spoiled very easily. If you harvest tomatoes and if you don't use it within a couple of days or maybe a maximum a few days, depending of course on the weather also, they are prone to inflict big losses to the farmers because they get spoiled so easily, right? Now, to give them a higher shelf life, which means to give them more time to ripen and rot. right so that is what is mean by giving a higher shelf life so this is a type of variety flower sour variety uh, of tomato and interestingly it was the first commercial commercial transgenic crop right first commercial transgenic crop of the world somewhere in 1984 i think it was released and uh, first you know uh, cultivated on a commercial scale so now to come back to what exactly is this variety this is a variety with high shelf life right now this actually makes use of what is termed as the anti sense rna technology right now this is a technology that leads to gene knockdown right gene knockdown now what exactly is the meaning of gene knockdown this means to suppress the expression of a certain gene not completely but to a considerable extent now there are two words used in genetic engineering one is gene knockdown and the other is gene knock out right so what is the other word this is gene knock out so this means complete silencing of the gene which means it is not expressed even a teeny weeny bit 
right so this is complete silencing of the gene and this the gene knockdown actually means an incomplete silencing which means some level of expression takes place but not completely so this is a kind of gene knockdown in which a particular gene for which codes for the enzyme uh, polygalacturonase polygalacturonase now this enzyme actually leads to ripening some processes of ripening and rotting which which actually means the softening of the tissues softening of fruits so this is responsible for softening of fruits so this this technology can actually reduce the expression of the gene which makes polygalacturonase so that this enzyme is produced in very tiny amounts and it takes a lot of time for the fruit to soften and then you know uh, get spoiled you know that whenever the fruit is hard enough it's less likely to undergo spoilage if it, it becomes soft then it is more likely to undergo spoilage right so this is a type of gene knockdown right now uh, i took this uh, this this opportunity to tell you about the gene knockdown and knockout which are both gene silencing procedures which means procedures which can reduce the um the expression of the genes not completely but to a large extent right and let me also tell you even the interference rna technology rna i technology that you are studying about is also a knockdown technology which means that also reduces the expression of the genes to a large extent right all right so the question number 9 asks you the method of xenobiotics by application of microbes is called now to understand this question we will have to understand the meaning of all the four terms that are sounding unfamiliar to you so let me write them down for you so that we can take them up one by one now this is actually a question which has been asked in one of the previous exams rather let me tell you most of the questions rather probably all of the questions have been previously asked in the neat examinations and i usually make it a point not to you know put my brains to it too much but to ask the questions which have been previously asked so that you get the hang of what kind of questions might appear and what is it that you really need to you know put your efforts into memorizing and understanding so this question has appeared once and uh, so we need to know what is a xenobiotic right we also need to know what is bioremediation we need to know what is bio augmentation and we need to know what is phytoremediation right so these are the four terms in front of us and let's try to find this out now what is a xenobiotic a xenobiotic the word xeno in latin means something which is foreign right and biotic means something to do with the living world living organisms or nature maybe right well to be more precise the living organisms now a xenobiotic is any substance which is not originally present in a particular organism or a particular environment uh, as it comes along which means it it was not a normal component of that particular organism or environment now this actually is a very wide term right it is used for the chemicals like the pesticides the pollutants a large number of cancer causing pollutants like if you have heard of the pcbs which is the poly chlorinated biphenyls right these are one of the most important xenobiotics or the the pollutants found in the detergents which actually make their way into the water bodies so for the water body the pcb is a xenobiotic right it is something which is foreign to it foreign to the organisms found in the water body right now sometimes a xenobiotic may be a substance which may be present earlier but not in the high concentration so even the concentration is important here right so pesticides pollutants carcinogens these are all actually classified as xenobiotics and a wide use of the term actually also includes the transplanted organs right even the transplanted organs from another species well this is a new one actually uh, let me tell you 
that among the different animals it is actually the pigs whose organs resemble the size of the human organs so what is being tried is that if we can somehow raise pigs with human genes by genetic engineering of course then we might be able to use the organs of the of such transgenic pigs to transplant them into ourselves do you know which is the most transplanted human organ well any any guesses i'm waiting for the answer let's see which organ in the human body is the most frequently transplanted organ let me get it from you any answers aditya kidney yes completely right it's a kidney so yeah shivanshu congratulations yes it is definitely the kidney which is the most frequently um, the transplanted organ but you must also know that there are many people who die because there is a dearth there is a paucity there is a lack of these organs available when the people need it right so what is being now tried by the scientists is to make transgenic pigs by putting human genes into the pigs uh, so that the organs are not rejected by the humans and then use the pig organs for transplantation into human beings so that's something really new being tried so in a broad use of this term xenobiotic even the transplanted organs from the other species may also be termed as xenobiotics however we will stick to the the use of the word xenobiotic to uh, chemicals to to substances which are not naturally present in the concentrations now find found there that includes the pollutants and the pesticides the heavy metals the cancer causing agents and all those it is called geno xenobiotics right now what is bioremediation using the living organisms living organisms particularly the microbes for you know sucking up or eating up uh, the the different toxins in the environment or the xenobiotics in the, in the environment is termed as bioremediation you must have heard about a very very important uh, microbe to that effect pseudomonas pseudomonas a certain strain of pseudomonas which is genetically engineered is called the superbug right so this is used to clean up the oil crude oil from the you know oil spills where the in the oceans the tankers sometimes leak out and the crude oil is oil you know all over the ocean so this is the pseudomonas is used there that is called the superbug right similarly there are so many other microbes some you know that the microbes in fact you have studied it in diversity among the five kingdoms the kingdom which shows a maximum metabolic diversity is the kingdom monera the kind of different types of reactions that the monerans can undergo the kind of variety of the substrates that you can they, they can use for energy that's that's so that's so interesting you know you know you and me can use very few types of substrates most commonly you know we we, we use that glucose and some specific types of carbohydrates and proteins and fats but the microbes can use the most unusual of things for energy i mean just imagine a microbe using uh, you know uh, octanes to derive energy by <laughs> so you know the microbes can use a number of organic compounds to you know get energy and the interesting thing is that through genetic engineering now new pathways are being tried out so that the microbes are now can now probably you know take up those substances which were which they were not able to take up up till now but now they can be engineered to take up you know chemicals maybe like ether and all sorts of organics and uh, substances to derive the energy from them so since microbes are the metabolically most diverse we use this for this process we use the microbes mostly right so this process of using the microbes to clean up the toxins the uh, to accumulate the heavy metals to 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 do this and to do that so that is what is termed as bioremediation now obviously the 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 question arises can these microbes do it uh, naturally or or do we have to genetically engineer them uh, actually both are true there are uh, many microbes which have a natural capacity to do, do this but we can actually increase the capacity of doing this uh, by uh, genetic engineering and that is what we did in the super bug right uh, i hope you know that it was an nri indian anand mohan chakravarti who in uh, usa he actually was the one to make this super bug and then he got the patent for this also right so what is bio augmentation now the word augmentation means enhancing or increasing the efficiency right so this actually means by adding specific microbes specific populations of microbes 
increasing the efficiency of certain processes like increasing efficiency of sewage treatment for example so we know that processes like sewage treatment are carried out by uh, some populations of bacteria and fungi and of course there are some algae which help by giving the oxygen but if we need to increase the rate at which that happens we can actually identify certain populations which were not there originally but can be added there along with the original ones so that the process the rate becomes faster the rate of the cleanup becomes faster a rate of the decomposition becomes faster so increasing the eff efficiency efficiency and the rate also for the processes of cleanup so that is bio augmentation now what is phyto remediation now obviously the remediation is the same here as we were discussing but the word phyto refers to the plants so we can actually also use certain plants there are some plants which can accumulate uh, and by accumulating those toxins they can actually clean up the environment right or sometimes they don't accumulate but they secrete certain chemicals to immobilize the pollutants or somehow or the other when plants are used to clean up the environment of the xenobiotics or the pollutants then this is termed as phytoremediation now in this question there's a slight drag and what i would uh, like to discuss here is that when we type talk about xenobiotic uh, cleaning up by the application of microbes actually this holds very much true for the options one and two although the term phytoremediation is not very very specific to the microbes but if we use it loosely then we can include it here and that is how the answer becomes four because one and two are very specifically related with microbes only and phytoremediation can be loosely also used in that sense right so here the answer is four i hope you're satisfied with the entire explanation that i gave you i will move on to the next question if you still have doubts do come back now question number 10 says golden rice is a promising transgenic crop when released for cultivation it will help in so all of us know from ncrt also that golden rice is one of those crops which um, helps in overcoming nutritional problems so this is a rice which is very high in vitamin a right and vitamin a helps to alleviate or you know i would say it helps to control the problem of a night blindness which is a deficiency disease caused due to the deficiency of vitamin a right so uh, do you know however i recall that there was a question asked somewhere in neat uh, how many types of golden rice genetically engineered have been released now golden rice one was uh, released somewhere in i think 2001 and golden rice 2 was then released somewhere in 2005 and golden rice 2 has 23 times more vitamin a than this one right so this means the the genetic engineering is really progressing and how we can increase the concentration of the nutrient that efficiency is also increasing right now question 11 says a genetically engineered microorganism used successfully in bioremediation of oil spills is a species of i think i answered that one right so this is actually pseudomonas uh, pseudomonas the species name is um, putida putida also called fluorescens right so both may be used at different places so pseudomonas putida or pseudomonas fluorescens is the name of the species of the bug which is now used to clean up the oil spills it is first used in texas you know texas and as i told you it is am chakravarti who was the, the one responsible to make this you know so to make this super bug he actually put genes into this bug from 13 different strains of bacteria right so he took genes from 13 different strains of bacteria and put them into this particular bug so that it can you know degrade substances like octanes hexane tegins toluene xylene you know about crude oil right petroleum so petroleum actually is a mixture petroleum is a mixture of so many things like octanes decanes hexanes right and things like toluene naphthalene xylene right 
so many different things so actually it is not possible for any one microbe to clean up all these organic compounds right so it actually needs to be given the genes to degrade all these things then only it will be able to do so so in fact there are some plasmids in the bacteria which have the capability of degrading xylene toluene but they're not all found in the one in one single bacterium so this this job of putting them into one single bacteria was done by anand mohan chakravarti to make this super bug now isn't that an interesting fact if, if i ask you what did you have for dinner mr microbe the microbe says i had toluene today for dinner <laughs> so this is what they they actually use for respiration and uh, getting their energy from so that's their food actually right so they decompose them respire them and get the energy and of course we are benefited because if they use petroleum uh, for doing that they can clean up the oil spills right now question 12 says which of the following is not a product of genetic engineering now um, the the correct percentage here as i see okay i am not being given the correct percentage here so the first option insulin you know that from ncrt that insulin has been produced uh, by genetic engineering you also know about bt corn you also know about bt potato which means all the bt crops are actually a result of genetic engineering so this was actually a very very easy question simple straightforward fact based from ncert now hybrid maize definitely is not the product of genetic engineering it is a product of conventional hybridization hybrid corn which is also called the high lysine corn which has different varieties like proteina ratan and all those uh, varieties that we talked about now these these varieties of maize are actually formed by hybridizing two different varieties of maize so this is not a product of genetic engineering so i hope that's also clear the 13th question says the genetic defect adenosine deaminase deficiency ada deficiency may be cured permanently by now this is a question that requires you to think a little bit more uh, than what is given straightforwardly in ncrt which means you need to read between the lines of the ncrt but if you do that you will be able to make out the answer now uh, okay i think uh, i will just first give you the the broad process that we are following here for ada therapy and then we can discuss the answer to this question so what we do here is we are actually following the x y o approach now what does it actually mean the x y o approach we talked about in vivo in vivo means within the living organism x y o means we take out some cells from the living organism and then we uh, transform them and then put them back into the living organism so what is being done these days now let me take this as a human okay so this is a human now what we do is we remove some cells the uh, bone marrow cells which are the 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 lymphocyte precursors we know that the lymphocytes are made by the bone marrow cells there are specific cells in the bone marrow which are called lymphocyte precursors right so we take these cells out right and once we have them here suppose with us we first add the good ada gene right uh, by the obviously i'm not going into the details of the procedure how exactly it is done you know that it is done by using the initially it was done using the gamma retrovirus vector right but later when it uh, came out that this vector may sometime start to you know uh, it actually activates the blood cancer genes and it may as a secondary effect it may cause leukemia in the patients so now we are not using gamma retrovirus we are using another kind of retrovirus which is called the lentivirus now there is okay i'll give the name here to you the lentiviruses do not not activate proto oncogenes right so what are oncogenes oncogenes are the cancer causing genes and proto oncogenes are the inactive form of the oncogenes right so what what we saw was that using the gamma retrovirus could activate the proto oncogenes to make to to you know cause leukemia or blood cancer in the patients who received this therapy so now we are not using that virus we are using now lentivirus which does not cause the leukemia so Uh, by using that retroviral vector we first put the good ada gene into these cells and then we put them back into the 
patient into the bone marrow of the patient so when we talk about the gene therapy you know first let's understand what does it exactly mean the gene therapy can actually be gene therapy per se and gene replacement therapy right now these are two different things this means if there is a bad gene suppose this is a bad gene the one which is causing the disease so what i do is if i simply add the good gene suppose the red developed red gene is the good gene right and i simply add it without bothering to remove this which means the bad gene can can stay there no problem we just put the good gene there and when it starts expressing the the problem is solved now that obviously means that this bad gene has to be recessive because it, if, it, if it if it were dominant then it would not allow the good gene to be expressed if that is the one which is recessive right now in gene replacement therapy we have to first take out or remove the bad gene and replace it with the good gene right in its place now this type of therapy has not been possible till date so what we are still doing in terms of gene therapy is just adding the good gene without bothering to remove the bad genes so that's the difference between these two now one more thing is if you are not doing the gene therapy this can actually target two types of cells one is the germ cells germ cells zygote cells right and this is the 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 somatic cells so we can have somatic cell gene therapy and the germ cell th gene therapy but this is illegal not allowed because we are not allowed to tamper with the reproductive cells now the po point therefore now arises that the the gene therapies that we are doing today are not gene replacements they are simply gene therapies and that too targeted at the somatic cells only right now so when for ada uh, treatment when we take out the lymphocyte precursor cells and put the good gene into them and then put them back right into the patients the patient will be cured to some extent but for some time only why because the lymphocyte precursor cells that we were using for the treatment to you know when when we transform them these also have a life span right it's not that they will keep living on forever till the end of our lives they will not they will have a life span after some time they will die so when they die we will have to carry out a repeat procedure again so which means in the current scenario when we are using the lymphocyte precursor cells from the bone marrow to transform to be transformed and put back this is not a permanent cure because those cells will ultimately die and then we will have to take out another set of uh, lymphocyte precursor genes and repeat the procedure right however this will not happen if we do this in the early stages of the embryo right so this is what it says that it will cause it will be solved permanently if we if we you know do this in the early embryonic stages because the early embryonic cells uh, they are uh, we could say they are they are the the dividing cells they don't have a life span so all the cells derived from it then will have that gene that we put into it by genetic engineering so that could be a permanent cure so i hope that is this clear to you uh, the second option is obviously very clear that in, we are not causing in this particular case as in ncrt you know enzyme re replacement is also a very temporary cure and we need to give injections on a regular basis right and similarly for periodic infusion of genetically engineered lymphocytes this is what we just this is what is happening right this is what we just discussed so this periodic inf infusion is not really a permanent cure right now administering adenosine deaminase activators this is this is not been possible as of now when the enzyme adenosine deaminase is is a defective enzyme you can do nothing to actually activate that so that is not an option at all right now we talk about question number 14 the two if there are any doubts please feel free to post them i will address each one of your doubts all right but i am moving on because uh, if if we move on uh, at a good rate we might have some time left in the end for the different questions that you have in your mind in, for this chapter the two polypeptides of human insulin are linked together by disulfide linkages this is something that we have covered now 15th question which kind of therapy was given in 1990 to a 4 years old girl with the adenosine deaminase deficiency this is a question that appeared in the neat examinations i think a couple of years back so i just uh, thought you would uh, 
I would need to know this. Now, uh, actually, for this uh, particular um, question, the uh, the answer is very simple. I'm sure you all must have marked it correctly. It was the gene therapy. Now, uh, if in option four, it was gene replacement therapy in, instead of enzyme replacement therapy, what would be the answer? Would it be gene therapy or gene replacement therapy? I, I talked to you about this just now, you know. So I told you that all the gene therapies taking place till date are, are simple gene therapies. We don't have a gene replace ther replacement therapy because it's a very, really, very, very difficult job to pinpoint the bad gene inside the cell and then first take it out and then replace it with the good gene. Now that's actually a very, very tough job, right? Now the 16th question is the crops engineered for glyphosate are resistant or tolerant to fungi, bacteria, insects or herbicides. Now these, this, the answer to this is four. These are uh, actually resistant to the herbicide. Now I will tell you why we came to this answer. Now this is actually something not given in the NCERT but uh, would like to tell you that the first transgenic crop in the world was the glyphosate resistant tobacco right okay i will give you a list of firsts okay i will uh, take this opportunity to tell you about the first transgenic organisms so first transgenic organism to ever to be made you know about this one this is given in ncrt right can can you give me a guess Okay, I'll leave this uh, open. You can tell me what is the answer to this. Let me see how well you read the NCRT. I will tell you about the first transgenic animal. So, first transgenic animal was made in 1974 and it was a mouse, right? The first transgenic crop was made in the somewhere in the 1980s and this is the uh, tobacco plant which is called the Gly. Glyphosate. So here we are talking of the plant, right? Glyphosate resistant tobacco, right? Actually, it was the first commercial, commercial transgenic plant. First commercial transgenic plant, right? Actually, for the food, when we talked about flower sour, that's the first transgenic, transgenic food crop right gmo food crop and this was uh, used some it was made somewhere in the 1980s and glyphosate resistant tobacco now this means this is the name of a weed side a chemical which can kill the weeds or you know that weed sides are also called herbicides right so we have tobacco plants which are not affected by the weed side glyphosate why because if you have a crop field suppose this is our crop right and these are the weeds right the red ones are the weeds now if i spray glyphosate if i spray glyphosate on the crop then all the plants will be wiped out because glyphosate is a chemical which can kill all the plants but if i have a plant the crop plant genetically engineered to have the glyphosate resistance gene glyphosate resistant gene then these will not be killed whereas the rest of the weeds will be killed so this was a novel method by which you know to control the spread of weeds and you know to reduce uh, reduce the competition from weeds uh, instead of taking out taking them out manually or using the dalapons and the other auxin related ovidicides uh, people thought it was a good way if we could put the vidicide resistance gene into the crop which we have to save and spray the herbicide on uh, on the rest of the field so that the rest of the crop the rest of the plants are wiped out and the rest of the weeds are wiped out so this was uh, what is is actually here meant by the glyphosate resistance in the tobacco plants right so uh, the 17th question says the transgenic animals are generally produced for all of the following needs except all right so let's uh, see this is again from the section from ncrt uh, straight from the ncrt fact based simple question let us understand testing of vaccine safety yes we know that uh, this is actually being done testing of chemical safety yes it is also being done uh, stimulation of pathogenicity 
Now this is actually quite simple when you know that pathogenicity means the ability to cause disease, right? So uh, definitely we do not have transgenic animals to try to stimulate the cause of the disease, right? So of course we have the transgenics for pharmacological important proteins, which means proteins used in the uh, treatment of various diseases, right? So this is again pretty straightforward question. The 18th question uh, is what is the advantage in clinical use of humulin, which is the human insulin, uh, we discussed that produced through recombinant DNA technique over the use of conventional ox or pig insulin. Yes. So uh, you know that, okay, which year? So you, okay, you had to tell me something. Are there any answers Aditya? No. No answers? So let me tell you about the first transgenic organism. I was about to rub that out. The so first transgenic organism was the bacterium E. coli, which was uh, made transgenic by the two scientists Herbert and Boyer in the year 1972-73. Yes. So remember, this is the canamycin-resistant E. coli, the antibiotic-resistant E. coli, right? So this is given in the NCRT, and again. Now, if I were to put up a question to you asking, which was the first transgenic organism to be made? You, will you tell me, ma'am? Uh, we don't know. It's not there in the NCRT. It is there in the NCRT. You know that it's given that in the Herbert and Boyer were the ones to first create the recombinant DNA and put it inside a bacterium to make an antibiotic resistant bacterium. So that was the first organism, right? So that is an immediate fallout. That is actually most logically to be interpreted by you in that sense, right? So many things are not written in so many words, but you must actually, you know, learn to interpret the statements in that manner, right? So the next question is that uh, advantage, yeah, advantage of using the clean, the use of humulin, that is the human insulin produced through genetic engineering. So again, we are at a question which are, which is taking us back to human insulin so there was somebody who did not understand how it is made so let me take two minutes and explain it to you here right okay so what am i doing here as i was explaining it to you the human insulin has a chain which is about 21 amino acids uh, the b chain which is about 30 amino acids right and held together by the disulfide linkages uh, from this paper, it would actually be becoming clear to you that there are a lot of questions which pop up uh, related to, you know, the, the human insulin and how it is being formed through recombinant DNA technology. So this, this particular part of the chapter must be really clear with you and not just reading the NCRT. Please, please Google it or read it from a good uh, dependable source, of course. Uh, how exactly was this done? Watch videos because sometimes to clear your concepts, you know, you need to know how it is happening in front of you. So I will definitely you all are actually you know you belong to the generation x so if to understand something you have to you know rely on um, somebody to keep explaining to you again and again i would say you know you're not doing the right thing please go to the youtube video section there are so many nice animations available to show you how some processes like transcription translation so beautifully illustrated through videos how is this actually happening so if you have a mental picture of that thing you know happening you will actually uh, we know that will help you to clear so many of your doubts and you know give you conceptual clarity on that account so very important for you to, is to do that but still i will explain it here the human insulin the functional human insulin is this this part right it is all made up of amino acids and um, as i told you initially it is sec secreted in the form of pro-insulin from where from the beta cells of the islets of langerhans in the human in the mammalian pancreas right so uh, this insulin if we want to obtain through genetic engineering what we do is we isolate the nucleotide sequence or the gene if i want if i could use that word or the gene for chain a right and also isolate the nucleotide sequence could we uh, just omit this written part you've done that isolate the nucleotide sequence or the gene for chain b separately right which means uh, let us take this as the nucleotide sequence for gene 
for the chain A, so we can call it gene A. And suppose this is the gene or the nucleotide, nucleotide sequence for the chain B. So let's call it the gene B, right? Now what we do is we have them separately available to us and then we take a vector, right? We take a plasmid vector, right? Cleave it by using the restriction enzymes and we use the same restriction enzyme which we used to cleave these genes because that is the key to their ligation. Then only they will join if they have the same sticky ends and that will happen only when we cut them with the same restriction enzyme, right? So we cut it here and insert gene A here, right? Like this. Obviously this is also second double stranded but for simplicity I'm drawing it like that. So this is A and this is B. This is a gene construct for A and B with the vector so that makes a recombinant DNA, right? So what I do is now I put these inside the host cells. Now host cells here are the E. coli cells, right? So I put this one here and this one here. So this is for the A and this is for B. Now when I put these genes, these genes belong to the humans, right? Isolated from the human cells. So when we put them here, now what will the bacteria, what will, what will be the bacteria's response to the gene? Now imagine that you're a bacterium and somebody has just pushed in a, a foreign gene into your body. What, what do you do, right? Now bacteria don't really have a nervous system. So they will not, may really not respond by saying, no, I don't need this, it's not mine, of course. Now biochemically, how does it uh, respond, you know? So when it, when the gene goes in, the, when the foreign gene goes in, if this foreign gene has a proper promoter that can be recognized. Can you open this up for me, please? So as we were telling, the expression needs the proper promoter. Without the proper promoter, the expression will not be there. Why? We have, we know that the transcription is carried out by the enzymes called RNA polymerases, right? RNA polymerases. Now this RNA polymerase is belongs to the bacteria. So it is the prokaryotic RNA polymerase. Now a prokaryotic RNA polymerase will recognize only a prokaryotic promoter, right? So if this has here a prokaryotic promoter, so this red thing that I've drawn here is the prokaryotic promoter, which means before inserting it into the vector, I will have to attach here or whichever side is the upstream side, we will have to attach a prokaryotic promoter here and then put it in the vector. Otherwise, if it doesn't have the prokaryotic promoter, this no, this nothing is going to happen if you put the gene but no prokaryotic promoter. So if this is a prokaryotic promoter, then the RNA polymerase of the prokaryote will go and recognize it and go ahead to, uh, you know, uh, transcribe that insulin gene. So actually we are fooling the bacterium into thinking that this gene is your own gene. Please, please transcribe it. Please express it, right? So how are we fooling it? We are putting a prokaryotic promoter, uh, you know, just before the eukaryotic gene that we want it to express, right? Otherwise, why, why would the bacterium make insulin for us? Is it doing a lot of charity for us? No, of course not, right? So to make it express that gene and to give us the insulin that we need, we will first precede it and attach it to the prokaryotic promoter. And that is why I was saying for expression, promoter is the most important thing here. Reporter has nothing to do with this whole process. Reporters are for selection of transformants from non-transformants, recombinants from non-recombinants. So please make this clear. Read up a little bit more about it, right? So prokaryotic promoter we put here. So this comes, recognizes it, and this expresses first to form the messenger RNA and then to form the insulin protein. So from here we get the chain A, from here we get the chain A like that, from here we get the chain B, right? Now we can then put them together. When we put them together and in special circumstances we, we put some certain chemicals uh, to balance the pH and then the disulfide bonds are you know, formed between the two and then we have the functional 
humulin which is a recombinant insulin which we get through this process now i hope you're understanding this process now i will go back to that question once again why can't we use the messenger rna now i will tell you now in the originally in the human cells as i told you the entire dna sequence that makes the insulin has the gene for a sequence c sequence this a chain c chain and the b chain the entire thing so when it transcribes and makes the messenger rna this messenger rna will also have the 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 sequence for the a chain c chain as well as the b chain right so when it translates undergoes translation this is transcription and this is translation so when it translates it translates into the pro insulin and not the functional insulin so if we isolate if we take the messenger rna and form the cdna from it we will ultimately uh, get it to express into this pro insulin so if the bacteria forms the pro insulin right okay let's let's do that let's take this messenger rna right this is the messenger rna and suppose i make it undergo reverse transcription and then polymerization to form a double stranded dna so i get something of this, this type only except that it doesn't have any exons and introns uh, no introns that is it has only exons right so only exon dna we get here right now if from this if i put this inside a host like i did there you know, with the help of a vector right so the product that i get from here is not the uh, functional or a chain or b chain or functional humulin the product i get from there will be this i get the a chain the b chain and the c peptide so what i get is pro insulin so what what i do what do i do with this pro insulin the bacterium has no means no mechanisms to cut this and convert it to a proper insulin so the bacterium cannot do it right and even we don't have such a precise mechanism to you know cleave it at the exactly the right point because one amino acid here and one amino acid here will spoil the whole thing right so we don't have the proper mechanism to cut it so that is the reason why we are not using the messenger rna i hope now it's clear right all right so next question is bacillus thuringiensis uh, okay let me give you the answer first so before this uh, happened you know before we started getting the humulin earlier we used to use porcine which means from pig porcine insulin and bovine insulin bovine insulin is from the cattle right so before that before we now uh, when we now of course we have humulin which is the recombinant insulin before we used porcine and um, bovine insulin which is not exactly the same as human insulin in fact there is a difference in the number of amino acids as well about 53 amino acids in bovine insulin so which means if it is not exactly same the efficiency will not be the same first thing right second it will cause allergic problems because it is a foreign product right so anything foreign to human body is likely to cause an allergic response also so immunological responses are also very common in this case right that's the answer one Bacillus thuringiensis forms crystal protein crystals which contain insecticidal protein. Now this is straight from the NCERT, very conceptual. Uh, well, actually very simple fact, but not not even a lot of concept here. So you know here that the answer is uh, the uh, epithelial cells of mid gut is where it binds to. It induces pores, causes cell lysis, and ultimately the insect get killed. And you know that it is activated by alkaline pH, right? and uh, it does not kill the carrier bacterium which is itself resistant to this toxin yes it does not right the bacteria why is that bacterium killed tell me so bacterium is not killed because this, this is in the form of protoxin right it is coded by several genes including the cry, gene cry now uh, actually the the set of genes that uh, make this is is actually all the genes are called cry right so this therefore this is not a very precise statement the fourth one and therefore the third is the most precise statement as given in the ncert therefore we have marked it as the answer next is the first clinical gene therapy was given for treating now this question keeps appearing somehow it got um, repeated so you know the answer to this this is ada deficiency which is also called uh, the skid 
severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome right skid now introduction of food plants developed by genetic engineering is not desirable so now here we are talking about the gm foods now uh, uh, do you know children that there is a big hue and cry in the world about this uh, these gm foods uh, if you google things if you try to find out there are so many activists who have now raised the flag against the gm foods or the genetically modified foods genetically modified foods do you know that you don't even know it and you're eating a large number of genetically modified foods without anybody telling you which means when you go out to buy that uh, uh, that uh, that legume that may, maybe that uh, rajma that that kidney bean that uh, that pulse so nobody's telling you but they might be giving you a genetically modified food now uh, so much so what is the problem with the genetically modified foods actually there are a lot of problems associated with the genetically modified foods and that is the reason why the activists now are actually championing their rights of the people by saying that if there is there is a genetically modified food being sold in the market in the packet should specifically say that right because we need a choice whether to eat a genetically modified food or not so what are the different problems associated with the genetically modified foods let me quickly tell you um, one thing is they are not they don't have that natural taste well uh, that's not a very important drawback however we can change our taste to it if all the rest of the things are fine but the problem with them is that at times the microbes in our gut in the in the intestine in the elementary canal human digestive system may acquire the antibiotic resistance genes right antibiotic resistance genes and become super bugs which cannot be controlled by any medicine right i hope you're understanding this suppose we have a normal cholera bacterium or a typical flu virus somewhere inside a body and we keep eating gm foods now you know that where do the antibiotic genes come into picture you know that the antibiotic genes are used as selectable markers right along with the vectors inside the vectors uh, to create the recombinant dnas and then to select out the transformants so what may happen is that when you eat the gm food the antibiotic resistance gene can be taken up by the viruses and the bacteria and the other pathogens inside the body and by taking them they can acquire the resistance to different antibiotics now think of a situation when you have a certain problem or a certain flu or a certain um, uh, you know infection in your stomach you go to your doctor and your doctor tells you okay you just take the small simple antibiotic for three days and you'll be cured but you come back take that antibiotic but your symptoms keep becoming worse and worse and you know nowhere near, near uh, you know becoming better so what is the reason for that so it is possible that if you have been eating uh, gm foods that particular uh, antibiotic it has become resistant to by acquiring that gene from the gm foods so that is not working that antibiotic is not working you might go back to the doctor another antibiotic it may still not work and by the time something does you may be really 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 very sick so think of that situation so the viruses and the bacteria and the other pathogens are actually likely getting converted to the super bugs which we will not be able to control and think of the situation when we are not able to control them how will we remain healthy right uh, now this is uh, obviously one of these and then of course there are other things like the weeds becoming super weeds but for our question this is the most important point here that there is uh, the the danger of entry of viruses and the different toxins which with the introduced crop because with the introduced crops there might be some foreign products 
which may enter the body and as you know that the viruses may actually gain the the antibiotic resistance and super they may become super bugs and then enter our bodies and cause a problem and pose a real threat to our health right so it's possible that these viruses even get these antibiotic genes outside of the body but when they enter our body then you know that's that's where the problem starts right so that's the answer becomes four right so uh, i hope all the questions are clear to you i am waiting for you to give me some feedback on the different uh, questions if there's something else oh yes there was one uh, doubt that came up from um, somebody uh, that was related to mi nsi rnas so let me solve that before ending how monocytes act as hiv factory how monocytes act as hiv factory HIV factory, okay. Ashutosh Pandey. Ashutosh Pandey. Alright. Great. Ashutosh, that was a good question. Uh, let me explain both these questions that we are left with. Alright. The first question is SI and SI RNAs and MI RNA and how monocytes act as HIV factories. Now, this one is relatively simple to explain, so I'm doing this uh, a little earlier so that we get away with it and then we start on with that because it, this will require a little bit of time. So monocytes, you know, they're a type of lymphocytes, right? And you know that the, these are the cells which are actually infected by the, the HIV virus, right? Now, uh, when we say of factories, it means a place where something is made in large numbers, right? A factory is a place where something is produced, production takes place in large numbers. So what exactly happens in the monocytes is when in the monocyte, you must uh, know a little bit about this gate 4 protein and the receptors. There are certain receptors on the surface of the lymphocytes, particularly talking about the monocytes. Now these receptors are recognized by the HIV virus with the envelope that it has and it enters the cell by the process of what is termed as pinocytosis. So the cell literally drinks the HIV up you uh, must recall pinocytosis means cell drinking so this is how you know when we were talking about how a certain um, uh, pathogen or a vector may enter a cell you know this is entry in disguise right so this um, this envelope the envelope of the hiv virus interacts with the receptor on the membrane and the cell thinks that this particular substance is something known to me it's okay so let me take this in so it literally drinks up by pinocytosis so the virus enters inside here and then of course what it does you know that it actually integrates its genome by reverse transcription into the dna of the host and uh, then it takes over the entire machinery then it makes more copies of itself and then finally leaves the a host cell by exocytosis you know so it enters by pinocytosis and leaves by exocytosis so HIV is using these cells to make more and more copies of itself the so production of the HIV virus progeny right so that is the reason why it is a HIV factory right now we are using this however for our benefit in the ADA treatment in the skin treatment because we are using these cells these lymphocytes as the packaging cells to increase the number of the recombinant viruses to be used in the therapy so whenever even if it is there is a hard side to it you know something wrong about it we will know a way to find the good thing about it we can use it for our own benefit so this fact that it is at a HIV factory is used by the therapist gene therapists to use this cell as a recombinant retrovirus factory as well that is the reason why it is called the packaging cell right uh, the actually in the current NCRT, there is not much detail of how this therapy is done, but in the previous NCRT, there was. And uh, today, we really don't have the time. Otherwise, I would actually explain the whole procedure to do it to you. But this will take a good 15-20 minutes. So, some other time for that, right? Now, let me take, uh, or you can actually probably uh, look at the lectures uh, and, and and find out from there what exactly the procedure is, right? So, I'll now go back to siRNA and miRNA. Now this uh, takes place, this is something related to interference RNA technology. So interference RNA technology, you know, is as I told you, 
a method of gene knockdown this is a method of gene knockdown right which means silencing the gene expression of the gene not completely but to a large extent right now in this particular process there are a couple of rnas formed which are variable in their size if there are about 21 nucleotides long we call them si rnas so si rnas is about 25 nucleotides long right and miRNAs are less than that, less than nucleotides. So the size of the RNA which is functional here is deciding whether it is small interference RNA or micro RNA. What is the time? Do we have time for a little more, more of explanation here? Or the session is about to go? We have five minutes, okay. I will explain this a little more to you how this actually works, right? So what happens is that in this particular interference RNA, first, you first must know that this takes place only in the eukaryotes. It is a cellular defense mechanism. It is a mechanism for cellular defense and gene regulation, right, for the eukaryotes. And this is probably arisen from the viruses and the transposons, right? That is what is given in the NCRT also. But how does this work? Let us see. This first involves the production of a long double stranded RNA, right? There are obviously from where are the RNAs formed? The RNAs are formed from the DNA. So we, we must first have a DNA here, right? So here on the DNA, we must have a gene for this double stranded RNA, which is involved in RNA interference. So we can call them RNA I. Right? So first this leads to the production of double stranded RNA by the process called transcription. Right? So now when this double stranded RNA is formed, it is cleaved by a special protein which is called the dicer protein. Right? This, is actually, this actually acts as an enzyme. Right? So an enzyme that cleaves the DSI. RNA, this double stranded RNA, to form a smaller RNA, right? So it cuts up, right, to form a smaller RNA. Now this could be either SI RNA and the length, it is length variable. If it is 20, about 21 nucleotides or somewhere about in that range, then it is SI. If it is less than that, then it is MI, right? Now actually this is a very, very complicated mechanism and many of the MI RNAs are also involved in pre-transcriptional uh, you know silencing also but that is just too much uh, beyond the scope of the discussion today i will stick to a very simple procedure that we can discuss here quickly so this uh, actually produces small rnas which is which are called the si or the small interference rnas now in this srna there is one strand which is called the guide strand and the other strand which is called the passenger strand right now what happens is that the passenger strand is degraded, P strand is degraded which means it is just you know um, broken up right. So we are now left only with the guide strand. Now there is a, a, another set of proteins which comes in complexes with it which is called the argonaut protein right. So we have this protein which is called argonaut protein. Now there are different varieties of this, it is also called AGO1, AGO2, depends on that. So we have this argo, argonaut protein which comes and joins with this and this whole complex which means the guide strand plus the argonaut protein complex, this is termed as the risk. So what is this risk? This is RNA induced silencing complex, right? So this RNA induced silencing complex is the main police dog, right? Let's see what, what it does. Now this uh, particular uh, complex called the risk moves about in the cell and if it happens to encounter or meet another double stranded RNA, oh, no, 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 not that double stranded, I was, I made a mistake there. It happens to encounter an RNA which and you know that RNA is a generally single stranded suppose this is a messenger RNA right this is a messenger RNA and 
when it complexes with the ribosome it would translate into a protein right so this is a messenger rna about to be translated in the cell so if it, this uh, risk uh, that that happens to see or encounter an rna and messenger rna which has so a portion which is complementary to the guide strand which means this strand if it is complementary to this portion somewhere in this portion it will come here and attach to it like this right and this argo protein generally the argo2 component uh, ago2 component will actually cleave this cut this up cut this messenger rna up completely so when the messenger rna is cut by the ago protein then the it, then it is not translated into protein and effectively we can say that the gene has been silenced which means gene is not able to express because even though it formed the rna but it is unable to form the protein because before it was going to form the protein it has been cut out by this risc so this process is actually used by many eukaryotic cells for uh, as a, as a as a defense mechanism to different viruses and uh, other other uh, um, you know kind I, I could say pathogens like nematodes right and this is also used by the eukaryotic cells to regulate their own genes right their own transposons that is jumping genes and uh, you know things like that so it's a it's a very very useful mechanism for the eukaryotic cells right i hope now that is clear to you please understand what question is how to make orally active protein orally active protein okay example pooch rahe hain so uh, how do we make orally active protein so what oh, there are actually a, a few of them available like there are uh, there is the oral oral polio vaccine if you uh, if you know about that and there are some other uh, orally active proteins also but how to make them generally what happens is when we take a protein uh, if if it goes into the gut then you know it is broken up because of the action of acids and alkalis and uh, then the enzymes you know they cleave up the proteins into amino acids and then it becomes non functional so what we have to do it we have to pack the protein up in such a way that uh, the acids and the alkalis are not able to have any effect on that which means we must have ph buffers associated with it then we also have to you know put something like uh, a surfactant a surfactant also protects the uh, the 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 protein from being acted upon by the different uh, you know things chemicals present inside our gut then we can also have some protease inhibitors which means we we need to have some chemicals which would inhibit the action of the protease enzymes right so that uh, it is not digested before it is absorbed right so there are uh, that's how we make the oral vaccines oral orally active proteins right any other questions children but uh, let me tell you something the uh, although uh, today i did not get the exact um, uh, you know correct percentage for each of the questions somehow we skipped out on that uh, and i really don't know how many of you found this paper tough simple moderate uh not not i i don't think you gave me that uh, response but uh, what i would like to tell you at the end is that if you keep working on the things uh, that you have been told by you know so many of your mentors like kapil sir and so many other good teachers that you have on this platform and other platforms so if you really stick to those things you would really you know meet success in no time so what you need to do is think like an examiner right so as i told you you could probably do the small task of you know dividing a chapter into sections suppose you have four friends four of you studying together make a team teamwork is always very very effective so uh, if you have four of you then divide the chapter into four parts and each one of you will get the task to make questions out of that section of the chapter which would baffle the rest of them which means you have to learn the art of making the questions yourself to understand what is the psychology of the paper setter so that is that is something i keep repeating because unless you do that you will not be able to answer you might you know interpret the question in a different way right and of course the may most important thing is don't panic right because sometimes the answer is right there in the question itself 
if the examiner is asking you something which seems beyond the scope of the textbook then be certain that there is something in the question that can give me an indication to what the right answer may be or sometimes the answer may be in a question which is you know somewhere ahead in the question paper so don't panic that's the first thing to do right yes, Shivanshu, well, and you just tell me one thing that uh, we insert patients pro insulin or active insulin form we uh, can we have the question again um, uh, we insert in the patient okay pro insulin or active insulin form pro insulin or active insulin form obviously the active insulin form because we we if we put the pro insulin form uh, okay when we inject the insulin into our blood the blood at the it actually carries it to the target cells right so who is going to convert the pro insulin into insulin not the target cells right so this is not done there obviously we have to inject the active insulin not the pro insulin because if we were to inject the pro insulin there was no, no problem at all i mean we, we, we wouldn't need the a and b chain separately right so active insulin form that's the answer any other questions totally clear totally clear great so I had a good time explaining things to you. I hope you have a great time reading these chapters and the others and come back to us for doubts. We're always there for you. All the best.